Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Rick, and I love you too. Um, I wonder if you've ever heard this before. The journey matters as much as the destination. Has anybody ever told you that? <laughs> yeah. Well-intentioned people like to remind those of us who are driven souls about this advice, but I never bought it. I never bought it. I'm a destination person by nature. In business and family life, I like to know where I'm going and how I'm going to get there, and the rest is just scenery, right? Right? Maybe? Does this sound familiar? Is this you or someone you know? Somebody who's so goal-oriented, so driven, they just keep their eyes focused at the end of the game, and they get to one place, they accomplish a goal, then they get to the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, and it never ends. This is a destination person. I have reached a lot of destinations in my life. Rick mentioned a few. Um, I suppose the best destination that I have ever reached was having the pleasure and the privilege of building a company of my own. Building a company from scratch. Does anybody want to do that? Anybody, any entrepreneurial minded people here? Uh, we can talk about that at dinner or tomorrow, whenever you want to. There's all kinds of stories that go along with entrepreneurial minded people. But um, that was probably the greatest adventure I've ever been on. The best ride of my life is being an entrepreneur. And with that came a lot of benefits. Um, certainly, you have financial freedom and reward. You have um, an opportunity to be recognized and known in your industry. Um, if you're in charge of your company, you have a lot of control and power over people. Those are a lot of good things. But they're not all they're cracked up to be because they don't last. They don't last. And if you're a destination person and you get to each one of these destinations, there's something that happens to you when you get there. And I'll tell you how it happened for me. There was a period of time in the life of our agency, and I'll tell you more about our agency as we go along, where we grew so fast and things were going so well. And on the outside, everything just looked great in my life. But I stopped sleeping. Now, I didn't have any trouble going to bed about 12.30 or midnight or 12.30 at night. And Ray will tell you, my husband, he says, she'll be talking and we'll be sharing stories. And then her head hits the pillow and she's just out like a light. So I had no trouble going to sleep. But about 2.30 or 3, every morning, I was wide awake. And I didn't go back to sleep. So I got up and I worked. And this went on for about a three-month period of time. And... You know, I had a lot of things that were stewing in my brain about, you know, things going on with the business and the kids and all that. But there was one question that was burning in the back of my brain that would never go away. And that was what was keeping me awake at night. And that question was, is this all there is? Is this it? All these things that I thought I wanted, is this all there is? And that is a frightening question to face if you are a destination person. Because if the destination isn't worth reaching, what are we striving for? Well, I did find an answer. And uh, it wasn't that the destination was not worth pursuing. But I will tell you what I had made a big mistake in. The destination was definitely worth pursuing, but in my pursuit of all those destinations, I had missed the journey along the way. But maybe, just maybe, if I could find a way to make the journey matter more, one, maybe I could start sleeping again, <laughs> which was kind of my primary issue. Um, but two, I wanted to find deeper purpose and meaning in my work. So that, so that I would feel fulfilled and that I would know that I was doing what God had planned for me to do. So I set about on this search, you know, to find the answer to this very deep question. And I remember sitting at the kitchen table one night and my husband said to me, you know, Elise, I know you're exhausted and you're dealing with all this stuff. And he said, we haven't taken a vacation in a long time together, just you and me. I mean, by this time, our kids were probably, you know, early teenage years, something like that. We were two-income couple, two careers, and we were just going and blowing all the time. But he said, why don't we take a trip together? 
And if you've ever tried to plan a trip with people you love, you know it's really more a negotiation than anything else. And sure enough, uh, I, we were negotiating on how to plan a trip together. And in a moment of insanity, I agreed to get on the back of my husband's motorcycle and take a 10-day trip. And I remember thinking, this is the craziest idea I've ever had. This is not a good idea. It's going to be very uncomfortable. I'd never ridden a motorcycle before. Um, I thought, you know, you have the helmet on, so your hair looks bad all the time. What if it rains? What if it's cold? Uh, I don't think the view is very good from the back. <laughs> uh, I'm not even going to get to drive. I can't even be in control. So I thought, this is not going to be that great. But I will tell you, I got on the back of that bike, and I never looked back. I was hooked. I was hooked on motorcycling. I, I, does anybody ride? Does anybody ride? Okay. All right. So what do you ride? Tell me. Oh, because somebody, <laughs> yeah, often that happens. You know, I used to ride, we were having a conversation with somebody over here who said, yeah, my dad ride till he was 40, and then my wife told me that I can't ride anymore. That happens a lot. But um, I will tell you, it is the most intoxicating way to travel. I, I had people often ask me, is it okay, does a scooter count? I said, yes, a scooter sort of counts. <laughs> but, but truly, motorcycling on two wheels is the greatest way to travel. It is intoxicating. The sights, the sounds, the smells. It's just an amazing way to travel. And I, was, I just fell in love with it. And when we came back from that trip, my husband said to me, Elise, you were meant to ride. You should learn to ride your own bike. And I said, me, ride? No, no, I like riding on the back of your bike. And he said, no, I think you need to learn to ride a motorcycle. So I did. I took the motorcycle safety course, and I remember sitting on, a, it was kind of a weekend type course, like you, you get your book in advance and you study, and on Friday night you have sort of a classroom type experience, and I remember sitting in the motorcycle dealership, the Honda dealership in Northwest Arkansas, with about 15 or 20 other people on a Friday night, and we had these two instructors, and one of them's name was Big Mike. And he's just exactly like you would think. He had the black leather vest and the tattoos on his arms, you know. And I think he felt like his job that entire time was to um, scare us a little bit, you know, to really make sure that the fear of what could happen to you was deeply ingrained in our brain. And I remember one point in the lecture that evening, he said something that made us all lean forward on our chairs to listen to what he said. He said, I'm going to teach you something that will save your life. He said, have you ever heard, or he said, let me tell you the most dangerous place that you can be on a motorcycle is in an intersection for obvious reasons. But he said, the second most dangerous place is in a turn. And the reason is because as you approach a turn, you begin to see all of these things that could go wrong. Um, in the turns are where all the hazards gather, gravel, oil slicks, potholes, um, all kinds of things that will make your bike slide. Not to mention the trajectory of the turn itself. If you guess wrong, you end up in a ditch or in the oncoming lane, neither of which is good. But if you've ever seen anybody that's over on the side of a ditch around a turn, they guess wrong. So there's a lot that you have to think about. But he said, as you approach a turn, you have to assess the hazards that are there in front of you. And then you make a game plan, and based on your instincts and experience, you know how you're going to maneuver through that turn. But you don't stare straight into it, because if you do, there's actually a name for that. It's called target fixation. Your bike will follow your eyes. So anybody who rides a, a, a bicycle knows that to be true, too. Your bike will follow your eyes. So if you stare straight into the hazards, where are you going? Right into that. So he said, instead, what you do is you focus on the end of the turn. And he said, that's called looking through the turn. It's a principle of motorcycling that allows you to, to see what's in front of you, but not, not stare straight there, but to look where you want to go. That is called looking through the turn. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my goodness, this is the greatest metaphor for business and life that I have ever heard of. Looking through the turn, keep your eyes focused on where you want to end up without being paralyzed by all the potential hazards right in front of you. And at that point, I began to think to myself, how could I become a leader who looks and leads through the turn? It really became my mantra at that period of time. 
because I wanted to learn how do I navigate the turns and the hazards of life? How do I still reach these destinations that I want to get to, but figure out a way to enjoy the journey along the way? And that is the balance, right? That's the balance that looking through the turn really captures, keeping your eyes focused on where you want to end up while still enjoying the ride along the way. And I knew if there was a way I could master both of those, that that could be my answer. That could be a way for me to learn to live and lead in the way that I knew God had meant for me to do. So tonight, I'm going to share with you a couple of lessons. I've got some different, different aspects of journey and destination that I want to share with you. Lots of stories. Hopefully stories that will help you um, think about how are you living your journey? What destinations are you trying to reach? Are you on the right path to get there? And what's missing? What's missing from your journey that will help you get to the destinations that matter most to you? So let's start with an area of journeys that I do not like called crossroads. <laughs> Crossroads. Who likes crossroads? I, probably not a hand's going to go over the room. Why? Why don't we like crossroads? Got to make a choice. Don't know what's down the path. Right? You, ever, you hear that saying, when you reach a, a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> because you know what? You're going to have to take something. Crossroads are scary. I don't like them because I don't like to choose. Oftentimes I say, well, in my next life, I'm going to do that, you know. <laughs> but you can't. You get this one chance to go around. And you have to think. Sometimes you have several choices. Sometimes you just have two really crucial ones to make. And you, just, you keep in your mind going, what if? How will this work out? What if it doesn't work out? I remember sitting in your seat. Now, back then, we weren't blessed to have Rick and Tim and MC and the whole gang. We didn't have Summit. But I sat at, uh, in the classrooms at ACU and loved, loved it. It was such a fabulous experience for me to be at Abilene. And, well, not in Abilene, but at ACU. <laughs> Um, because it was a turning point in life. You know, it's when you have a chance to really come into your own. And, but I remember my senior year, the spring semester of my senior year, oh my goodness, I was really scared. Because here I'd spent four years and all my parents' money to try to get this degree, and I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't have a job. I was coming out at a time of recession. Nobody was getting jobs. And I spent my entire spring semester trying to figure out how to get a job, where, applying everywhere, looking in different cities. I mean, I was doing everything I could to try to actually get a job in my field. And I was rooming in a house with uh, five of the girls. We had three bedrooms, so there was two of us to a bedroom. And my roommate, I remember, um, we decided going to bed at night that we were going to say out loud one verse together. Because this verse we had found really gave us a sense of um, hope. And it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You guys know this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what will he do? Make your path straight. And I would lay there in bed every night. I would just think, oh, please, God, please show me the way. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm scared to death. What if I'm a failure? What if I can't get a job? Where will I go? Where am I going to live? I had just broken up with a guy, so, you know, I wouldn't get married anytime soon. And I was just really torn. I was really frightened. It felt like maybe one of the first biggest crossroads of my adult life at that point in time. It was scary. Um, but I did find a job. I was offered a position in my field in public relations in Nashville, Tennessee, of all places. Didn't know anybody in Nashville, but I packed up all that I owned, which fit in the back seat of a VW Bug. <laughs> I drove to Nashville, Tennessee after graduation to work at a public relations agency there, just a small little firm. It was a fantastic place for me to be. Um, and I was excited to have my first job. And when you get your first job, um, and you're really thrilled to have it, there will come a period of time, though, when you will be eager for something else. And I remember it was about two years into that job, and I was looking around, and I was seeing all these other people that were having all these other cool jobs and positions and getting raises and promotions, and 
you know, you can't help it. You get a little jealous, you know, when you're competitive. And I wanted to, to, to rise. I wanted to be promoted. And I, every year I would talk to my boss, what do I have to do to get promoted? You know, he'd be like, at least be patient. But I just couldn't be patient. And I started looking around to take another job somewhere else. But all I could find were jobs in other types of fields, not, not in public relations. And I really kind of reached a low point where I thought, I, I know I can do more, and I feel like I should be able to, but I don't know what to do. Should I leave? Should I stay? Where do I go? Maybe should I move to another city? It's, once again, a crossroads moment. And I remember having an experience where I learned something really, really crucial. And it was, somebody challenged me to say, are you being your best where you are right now? I said, no, because I'm trying to get out. <laughs> I'm trying to move on. I'm trying to move up. They won't promote me. She said, maybe that's part of the issue. Maybe you need to be giving your all right where you are right now and then just see what God has planned for you. And it really changed my way of thinking because what, he, what she was asking me to do was to be fully present in that position even though I didn't like it and to give my best all the time and to stop worrying about what comes next. And the other wasn't working, so I thought, well, I might as well try it because it sounds good. <laughs> Maybe I'll try it and see. And that's what I did for about a period of three months. I went in every day. I gave it my all, volunteered for assignments. I really threw myself in. And I remember my boss came to me after a few months, and she sat down to talk to me, and she said, what's changed in you? Something's changed. I said, what do you mean? She said, you're different. You show up different every day. And I said, well, you know, it's no secret I wanted to have a promotion, but I kind of decided if that wasn't going to happen that maybe I needed to give my all right now. And she said, well, I'm so glad to hear you say that. She said, this is what I was waiting for. I was waiting to see you commit to what you were doing now because that told me that you were ready for the next step. And that was when I got the promotion. Interesting, huh? That was a really important moment for me to learn about how to be patient in the uncertainty of life. That God does have plans for us. They often don't work in our timing. <laughs> and I'll be the first one to tell you, nothing ever happens fast enough for me. But things do work out the way that they're supposed to. But God has a plan. And the question are, is, are you trusting in God? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, you must devote yourself to him and to doing what you have to do at that moment in front of you, and he will make your path straight. One other story I want to tell you about this period of time in life was um, how I found my husband, who I will say I have been married 31 years to. Yes, I was a child bride of 10. No. <laughs> yes, you go ahead and clap. <laughs> um, he is the most amazing guy, very patient, um, He's fantastic. And I had dated a series of guys after I got out of ACU that it just didn't work out. And I kept thinking something's wrong with me. And I don't know how you ever really know. And I remember having a conversation with my older brother at that time. And he said, Elise, this is how I think about it. He said, you have, uh, are like a farmer with a field. That, that is your life. And he said, you care for that field, you cultivate it, you weed it, you water it, you plant beautiful things in it. And he said, someday the right guy is going to walk along the side of that field and he's going to look to that area of beautiful land and he's going to see this magnificent crop of beautiful things growing there. And he's going to say, who is the farmer of that field? That's the person that I want to meet, somebody who's created these beautiful things in her life. And he said, I think of it like plowing your field. And he said, Elise, I think you just need to focus on plowing your field daily to be sure that beautiful things are growing in your life and trust that one of these days the right guy is going to walk along and see that beautiful field. And I remember thinking, I like that. Because it takes time, doesn't it, to cultivate beautiful things in your life. They don't just happen. You have to work at it to create a life that somebody wants to be a part of. And so that gave me some hope. 
and I met my husband. I met him at church. <laughs> I thought I knew everybody in that singles group, and I did, until the day he walked in the door, and there he was, handsome guy that he was, um, and it was an amazing thing. We were married almost a year to the day that we met. He was in medical school at the time in Memphis, and I was in Nashville, so we went back and forth for virtually a whole year to see each other on weekends. But I just knew the day I met him, he was the one. I came home to my roommate and I said, I have met the man I'll marry, but he'll never ask me out. And she said, why? I said, because he's cute and he's smart and he probably has, you know, all kinds of girlfriends. And, um, but I said, I just, I so much want to meet this guy and get to know him. And it, it worked out for us to be able to do that. And we got married. Uh, and I will tell you then the very next lesson on where we go in our lives, on our journeys, is that once we get through all of these crossroads moments, if you could advance that slide for me, where we go on these crossroads moments often lead us to detours. So I was happily married at this point in time, and jumping along in my career, and things were going great. We moved to Memphis, Tennessee, where my husband's in medical school. And um, I remember having this hope about when that time is going to come for us to be able to get out of his training and do something really significant with our lives. Where would we go? What would we do? And that was a really interesting time. Um, we were there for, I think, about nine years while he finished his training. And I moved up in different agencies. I did corporate life, had a lot of different experiences. And the time was coming for him to finish his training. And we started looking for a job for him. And I got this chart, and I put it on the kitchen wall. And I had listed all of these different places that we could go to live and all these people who were calling to interview him down one side. And then across the top, I had listed all the criteria of all the great, pla uh, all the great things that would, would be help us decide where we wanted to go and live. And I said, whenever we go on a trip, we're going to score these visits, and we'll decide then. And of course, I had an ulterior motive, which is I am a big city gal. And I thought, from here, we need to go up, like to Atlanta or Chicago or Dallas or some great American city, you know, because I have these aspirations for my career. And they were very simple aspirations. World domination, that's, that's fairly simple, right? That, how could, that's, that's not too much to ask. And I had been plodding away, waiting for these chances. And I thought, when we get to those big cities, I am going to take over the PR industry. So I had this big wall chart, and every time we go somewhere, I'd score it all. And we got this call one day from a, he's an orthopedic surgeon, he's retired now, but an orthopedic surgeon. We got a call from an orthopedics group in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And they really wanted him to come, and I said, well, you just go take that visit, and you just tell me all about it when you get back, because I'm not moving to Arkansas. Why would I move there? That's like the end of the earth. And he said, well, I think we should go because this is a really great practice. The Arkansas Razorbacks are there. Is there anybody here from Arkansas, by the way? No Razorbacks. I can't believe it. We always have somebody from Arkansas. Um, Woo Pig Suey. That's what they do in Arkansas. Uh, but I, he said, there's a great practice there. They take care of the college football team. Uh, it's a beautiful area. And I said, yeah, but it's in the middle of nowhere. And, like, that's not going to score well on our chart. <laughs> but we went for a, a couple visits, and I remember coming back from about the second or third time, and we got on the plane to come back home, and he grabbed my arm, and he said, what did you think? What do you think? And I said, well, you know, they're very nice people, but this is not for us. And he said, Elise, I think this is the place. I was like, get out. You can't stop kidding me. We're not going to laugh like that. That doesn't make any sense to me. Why would we do that? You've got to be kidding. And he said, I'm not kidding. This is where I think we ought to go. And there ensued a battle for several weeks. You know, he wanted to move to this little town in the middle of nowhere. I had my sights set on the big city. And I remember when it kind of came to a head where I knew that that was where we were going to go. He had his heart set on this. And here he'd spent all these years training, and this is where he wanted to go. And I was really mad about it. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm going to punish him for this in some way. So for about three days running after work, I would come home, and I would drag a lawn chair out of the garage, and I would pop it open on the driveway, and I would sit down in it, and I would just pout. 
And he would come home from the hospital and he'd come out to talk to me. And I'd say, no, I'm still not talking to you. You can go back in the house. <laughs> and the neighbors would come over and they'd say, did you guys decide where you're going to move? I said, yes, we did. They said, where? I said, Fayetteville, Arkansas. They said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I said, I know I am too. Because this wasn't where I wanted to go. And it was interesting because at that moment, I knew I had a decision to make. I loved the guy. I was going to go there. But the question was, was I going to go and be bitter? Or was I going to go and let change make me better? So are you going to go and be bitter? Or are you going to go and let change make you better? <laughs> I knew. I knew what I needed to do. I knew I needed to go and make this the greatest adventure we had ever been on. And it was really up to me. It was all up here. It was all up here. I went on a detour for 23 years to Fayetteville, Arkansas. And it actually turned out OK. <laughs> That's when I decided to start my agency. Because I remember thinking, at this time, I was in corporate life, and I had just w gotten what I thought was my dream job. So I was at all at the age of 32. I thought, this is as good as it's ever going to get. Ha, ha, ha. But I thought, this is it. This is the best I'll ever have, and now I'm going to the middle of nowhere. What good could possibly come from that? Now, you know stories in the Bible about that, too, don't you? People going on detours they didn't want to go on because they were called to go. And when you go on these detours, you have to decide if you're willing to go and let the change make you better. And when I got there, I started Mitchell Communications Group. And I'll tell you a funny story. So when I was telling my boss um, that I was going to leave from my corporate life, I remember walking into his office, and I sat down with him, and I said, well, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is I'm leaving. I'm moving away. He was like, what? I said, yeah. And he said, where are you going? Bay of Larksa. Oh, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so I was like, yes, I've heard that before. And I said, but here's the good news. I'm going to start my own PR agency, and I want to take you with me as my first client. And I slid a proposal across the desk to him. He said, oh, my goodness. OK, well, let me think about that. And do you know that he came back the next day, and he said, yes. <laughs> and then I remember going, Oh my goodness, I have no idea how to start a PR agency. <laughs> but wow, isn't that a sign of some kind? Now I'm slow, it takes me a while to figure these things out. But I remember thinking, oh wow, I'm going to have a chance to start my own company. Here's the time. And I had always dreamed of starting my own business. So I had at that time worked at three different agencies, one PR firm and two ad agencies, then corporate life. And I had a front row seat to entrepreneurship done right. Each one of those uh, people who had founded those companies um, were mentors of mine. And so I was able to really learn from them. So here was my chance. I'm moving to Fayetteville, Arkansas, but I'm taking my former employer with me as a client. So I tell people I cheated, you know, when I started my own business. I took my client, my employer with me as my client. But that was what got me started. And the agency grew and grew over time. In fact, there was a period of time that we grew over 500% in five years. And I remember at different times looking back and thinking, ah, this would never have happened had I not been willing to go on a detour. So let me stop and ask you a question. Are you on a detour? Are you on a detour in your life? Maybe it's a personal detour. Maybe it's a health detour. Maybe it's a, a detour of the heart. Something isn't going just like you planned. And what are you going to do about it? And I always say, this is when you have to scrap the map. And you have to go with the detours in life. Because when you do, you will find yourself in some pretty terrific destinations. God has plans for us. Proverbs 16, 9. You've heard this one before, too. In their hearts, humans plan their course. But the Lord establishes their steps. I learned how to be resilient. 
Resiliency is one of the things you have to have if you, have if you are going to succeed in your career. If you're going to succeed in life, you have to learn how to go with the detours and not let them define you in a negative way, but to go and let those changes make you better. Throughout my experience in all of these different things, I learned something called journey mindset. And this is one of the things I want to share with you to think a little bit, a little bit more about. We're going to dig into it after dinner a little more closely. But journey mindset is one of the things that really helped me as a leader. Because I was a destination leader, as you recall, somebody who was very focused on getting to where they want to go. So how do you learn to change that mindset? So there was a period of time, as I said, when our agency began to grow and really do well. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't really know how to do this. <laughs> That's one of the things you will learn in your career, that everything you do for the first time feels scary. And especially when you step up in leadership, it feels difficult, and it should. Because if you're doing things that are really easy and similar to what you've been doing, you're not growing, you're not stretching. And so I remember thinking to myself a lot while our agency was growing, I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> That's that imposter syndrome, right? I know you've already probably experienced that in your life. You certainly will in business. You can't um, allow that to dominate your thinking, though. That's a negative narrative in your head that does not serve you well. And I will tell you a story of how I learned how to manage that and how I learned the essence of the journey. Um, here we, we started, you know, I started my kitchen table, as Rick said, and by about, that was, um, I would say, in the early 2000s, we started growing the company. It began to build up. And in about 2008, which was during the, one of the big recessions that we had in our lifetime, that was when things started to go downhill for most people in business. But believe it or not, that was a period of time when we really began to rapidly grow. And we had, at that time, we were probably about 12 or 15 people, and we started growing hand over fist, just do, 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 do. Um, we got, went from like 15 people to 30, to 50, to 70. I mean, just each year was exponential growth. And anytime you're a part of a rapidly growing organization, you begin to learn <laughs> that you don't have enough people, you don't have enough resources, no, the systems don't work anymore, the processes don't work anymore, everything you kind of wrote out on the back of a napkin doesn't work anymore because you outgrew it, and you outgrew it so fast. And I remember that my, my people, especially my senior leadership team, they would run into my office with these problems, and they would literally be wringing their hands saying, Elise, Elise, we have this problem, and we don't know what to do. And it was sort of like they took this, this big lump of clay that was a problem, and they just went splat right on my desk. Here's this problem. What are we going to do? And I remember they would run in and say these things to myself, and I would think, I have no idea. But I think I'm supposed to know, right? I'm the boss. Doesn't the boss have the answers? The leader is supposed to know, but I don't know. So you would have this, this sort of this conflicting feeling of you want to solve the problem, but you really don't know the answer because we've never been here before on our journey. And that is a dark place to be. If you've ever had self-doubt, that is a dark place to be, and especially if you're in charge. <laughs> Have you ever been in charge of a class project or a group project or maybe something in your club or something in your, in your life outside of school where you were in charge but you didn't really know what to do? That's a scary place to be. And I remember thinking to myself, well, okay, I think I just need to just stand up and wave my arms and say, here's what we're going to do. And if you say it with a lot of confidence, everyone will go scatter and do it and then you can figure out if that was the right thing to do or not. And I thought, no, that's not really me. I don't think I want to do that. And I thought, well, you know, you could say, well, we'll just think about it and decide later, but then the moment has passed and maybe you missed an opportunity, and, but if you don't have enough information, how do you decide? It's, you're just having all this agony in your mind of what to do. And I learned something really crucial at that time, and it was learning to say this. What I said to my people was, I don't know, but I'm not going to end the sentence there. I'm going to do whatever it takes to find out. And it's okay to say that. It's okay to say, I don't know, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes to find out. And the best leaders 
invite all of their people to help them. They say, let's figure it out together. Let's figure it out the right and best solution for us because it may not be what somebody else over here is doing. You may need a unique solution to come up with the right answer. <laughs> and I remember at that time when I said that, and of course they kind of look at you with shock because they're thinking, you're supposed to know. And I said, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to find out. And I knew in my mind what it was. It wasn't that I wasn't working hard enough. It wasn't that I wasn't smart enough. I was all those things. It's that I had a gap of knowledge. There were certain things I didn't know about how to build and scale a company. How could I know that? That my journey had not taken me to that point before. Here I was in this state of great uncertainty, and I didn't know what to do. That was really scary. But you know what I did? I researched programs that taught entrepreneurs how to scale their companies. And so I did. I found one. I, it was a week-long executive education at Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire. And I remember going up there in November of that year, which is not a good time to go to New Hampshire. But I didn't go to do anything fun. <laughs> I went to go into that e learning experience because I had this burning platform, which is my company is going to fall apart if I can't figure out how to lead it and how to grow and how to learn the things that I need to know to help us succeed. Because the worst thing in my mind would be, what if our business fell apart like a house of cards when things were going so well? Whose fault would that be? Mine. So I went off to, to, to Dartmouth for this class. Week long, it was sort of like this, a classroom setting, and of course not in, in the beautiful Colorado mountains, but there were entrepreneurs from all different walks of life and different industries. We were all gathered there together, and every day they would have these professors that would stand up in front of you and they would teach you about all these different things. And I remember just like absorbing everything, you know, and I was one of those geeky students that was like near the front row every day, and I had my laptop out, and I have long fingernails, so I was, I was typing away like this, typing away. And I remember the second day, this guy leads over to me, and he said, what are you writing down? And I looked at him, and I said, everything that's coming out of the, word, the mouth of that guy up the front, what are you doing over here, taking a nap? Because I thought, how could they not be absorbing at all? He was just kind of sitting back in his chair, you know? But I thought to myself, he may not have this same panicky feeling I have, which is if I don't figure out how to lead, my company will suffer. And you know, I came up with all kinds of answers. That week was amazing. If you, like this, if you've ever been in a way, an experience where you're immersing yourself, your brain has a chance to think in a whole new way. You actually are clearing your space in your head and creating new wiring. New ideas, new connections are happening. There's a lot of neuroscience behind that. And that week, I remember at the end of every day, I, of course, I would take all these notes, um, and I would try to figure out, what does this mean to us? And I remember there was one day, it was like day three, this guy was standing up, and he was droning on and on about how to do these quality control programs for a factory. And I was like, well, you know, I run a professional services firm. We don't make things, you know, and how does that apply to us? And I remember saying, at least you've got to broaden your thinking, challenge yourself to grow. And all of a sudden, I came with this great idea, which was, we don't have a quality control program for our PR agency. In fact, we're growing so fast, there's probably mistakes going out the door every day, and we don't even know it. That's a problem. So I sat there, and I started coming up with all these ideas for it. And I remember, so excited, I shot off this email to our, our, uh, our leadership team at the agency, and they didn't respond. And the next day, I came up with another plan like that, and I shot off something else about another topic, another issue, another opportunity. And each day, I was writing all these emails off to the team. And after about the third time I sent something, they wrote me, and they said, stop sending emails. You're scaring us. <laughs> and it was because they could see, OK, she went for answers. She's found some answers. It was such an exciting time for me because it was where I began to finally see all of those connections and see how things could come together for us. And sure enough, when I went back to the agency, I was able to put a four-point plan in place to help grow the business to the next level. And it really became our blueprint. And when I stood back and thought about that later, from where I was before, I had such a, a feeling of failure because I didn't know the answers. But what did I do? I went and I found them out. 
you have to trust your instincts and know you are smart enough to figure it out as you go. Understand what you don't know or what you need to know and go and find out. This is part of a journey mindset. This is the ability to see the journey as part of the experience, okay? I don't know. I'm going to have to find out what is it I need to do to get there. Journey mindset is this idea of being willing to be an explorer in life and not being afraid to keep going even if you don't know where it's going to take you. You have to have some sense of risk taking, the ability to go and find out and to trust your instincts that you're going to be able to learn as you go. This to me was a gift because I was kind of a perfectionist, a control freak to some degree. I wanted to know. I wanted to have all the answers. I didn't want to make a mistake because what's one of your biggest fears in life? For many of us, if you want to be a leader, one of your biggest fears is fear of failure, fear of public failure. And a journey mindset helps us to think of failure very differently. Think of failure as a chance to learn. Can you do that? Have you been doing that in your life? Viewing failure as a chance to learn. This is actually a very entrepreneurial approach to your career and your business. We're going to try it. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Chances are something will work. We'll figure out what doesn't, and we'll make the improvements, and we'll get better as we go. Failure is an iterative process. This is actually something called learning mindset, growth mindset. You may have heard this. Carol Dweck, she's a very famous professor at Stanford who did some studies on growth mindset. But it's this idea that you view failure as a chance to learn and to grow. And those are the types of leaders who actually are the most successful because they're willing to take a chance. So I was teaching a leadership uh, re retreat uh, this past weekend, and I remember I had done all this planning and preparation, I was going into it, and at the last minute I was thinking of all these things that looked like they might not be right. And one of my teammates, she said to me, hey, she hit me on the arm, it's a journey. <laughs> I said, oh, that's right, it's a journey. So I find myself, even after all of this, still learning. Journey mindset, that's okay, because you learn as you go, and you keep putting one foot in front of the other, and that's how we get to where we want to go. That is really the answer to how we get to the destinations that matter most to us, is that you learn to enjoy the ride along the way. Now, I'm going to stop here, because I know we got to get ready for dinner. Um, Part two is I'm going to pick up and tell you some more things that happened for me. Um, talk a little bit about family and personal relationships and taking care of ourselves. Does anybody have any questions so far at any of the things that I have shared? Yes. It's an ongoing thing. Does, it, does anybody have trouble sleeping? <laughs> yeah. And whenever I tell that story, I get a lot of um, knowing looks. And it is a, it's a frightening thing. You know, sleep is underrated. Um, it actually, I'm going to tell you something. So um, I've spent this last year, and I'll talk more after dinner about this, on um, doing a lot of neuroscience training because I've now launched another business and I'm doing executive coaching and leadership development. And in this neuroscience training, I learned a lot about the brain. And if you guys are interested, we can dig into this tonight after dinner. But your prefrontal cortex is this part of your brain right over, right behind your forehead. It's where you do your strategic thinking. Um, decision making. It's where inhibition happens when you inhibit yourself from doing things you shouldn't do or say. That happens here. Your limbic system is the part that's over your brainstem back here. That's what your fight, flight, or freeze. That's your emotional regulation comes out of your limbic system. Did you know that those two parts of the brain do not work at the same time? And I'll tell you why. They compete intensely for fuel. So what's your brain's fuel? Do you know? Water, glucose, or as I like to say, good nutrition. All right, now not just sugar, but <laughs> glucose, good nutrition, and sleep. If you don't have those three things, you are not performing optimally 
in a cognitive way or in an emotional way. You know that. When you're hungry, when you're thirsty, you have no sleep. How are you performing? Pretty terrible, huh? <laughs> this, when I learned this, I'm telling you, it changed me. Because I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I thought sleep was wasted time. Do you guys ever think that? Well, oh, no, <laughs> no, no. Well, I'll tell you, for driven people, destination people, goal-oriented people, I always told myself, I will sleep when I die. It can wait, and it can't, because you know what? My ability to think at my best and manage my emotions, especially under pressure, were really hurt when I did not have rest. And so when I remember I would stand at the window at like 5.30 in the morning during this, it was about a three-month period when I couldn't sleep. And in the darkness of night is when all, that's when Satan works his magic on you. All of the demons in my life, all of the negative voices in my head were just drowning me out. It was horrible. And I would stand at the window, and I would just say, please, God, let the sun rise. Because when you see those first rays of light, it's like it all goes away. All of a sudden, you have new hope. And I would say, okay, today, today I can do better, and tonight I will sleep. But you know, you can't sleep if there is something that's burning in your brain. You just can't. And I think that is a way that our brains are telling us. You know, our brain works in the background all the time. It's telling you, you've got to deal with this. And you do. But you know what? So we have to have the courage to deal with it. That's part of the journey. Nobody has it all together. Everybody struggles. You know, if you looked around at your journey lines, has everybody had dots above the line? Of course not. Everybody struggles. But in our humanity, in our brokenness, we understand that God is the only way. He is the only way to help us find the peace that brings the rest. Let me leave that with you. We're going to eat dinner, <laughs> and we'll pick this up after dinner. How's that?